Desiree Kamika. I am the Director of Community Engagement and the Housing Network for the Madison House Autism Foundation. Today, we are going to talk about tiny homes. Um, tiny homes as an affordable housing solution for adults with autism or other developmental disabilities. Um, many of you have probably read the article that I wrote. Um, it's on the Autism Housing Network. For those of you out there who are interested in the Madison House Autism Foundation and what we do, um, they are the, the organization that has put together the Autism Housing Network. And um, the Autism Housing Network has been very um, generously sponsored so far by Case Studio and the Marriott Foundation and American Airlines. So super kudos to them uh, for sponsoring us and helping us being able to share the best ideas in housing for adults on the spectrum and others with developmental disabilities. So, tiny houses as an affordable housing solution. Um, for those of you who have never done this live stream thing, uh, I'm also kind of new to it. You can uh, ask questions and I can actually see them as I'm talking and can respond to your questions. So please feel free um, to ask a question and I'd be happy to address it. Before we get into the questions, we'll just quickly review what, uh, what were some of my thoughts and why I decided to write on tiny homes. Um, so I'm a family host home and the young man who lives with me is on the autism spectrum and he lives with us so that we can teach him the independent living skills necessary. He has a waiver, which means when he decides to move to wherever he decides to move, he'll have access to support services. Um, but where we live, it is very expensive to find housing, um, especially housing in more of a rural area. We happen to live on a ranch, um, and to find housing for him is close to impossible. And so when we found out that the tiny home jamboree was going to be just down the street from us, we decided to go. So I went with Daniel and he helped me put together this list. Um, the first thing that really appealed to him was that he would be able to own his own home and um, for somebody who may not have a lot of extra cash if they were to get evicted or lost their home to put a deposit down that's a really big deal I talked to a lot of self advocates in our area about their housing and they've had to move because the landlord has bumped rent they've had to be able to get a, a roommate when they didn't want to get a roommate um, one of them that lives in a section 8 um, housing project really liked it when he moved in but it's not really the same project that he moved into um, now years down the road and he he's really a little bit stuck um, so I don't want that to happen to Daniel and he really thought that it was uh oh no sound okay good thanks Mike ah. <laughs> and so he uh, really looked at this as an option because tiny homes are able to be financed. Um, they're not financed as a house, they're financed as like a recreational vehicle. Um, and there was a, at the tiny home jamboree, there were several businesses that were financing tiny homes um, at three to four percent. And for a tiny home, you know, we got to walk through some of them that were only $20,000. Um, and others were over $100,000, but still that's a pretty affordable housing option that he would be able to pay off just as if he was paying rent um, and he would own his home. So that was really neat. Mike says, are they financed furnished? Um, furnished is, is a funny word. So do they have a mattress? No, but is there a loft? Yes. Um, would you have any appliances? A lot of the tiny home companies that build, they can build you just a shell or they can totally uh, furnish it out. So it really just depends on who it is that, uh, that you're buying from. And so the other thing besides affordability, of course, was um, a potential for this to be, and this wouldn't work for Daniel, but I could see this working for other families, um, a potential future income stream. So say Daniel decides that he doesn't want to put his tiny house elsewhere. He wants to put it um, outside of our house, real close. He knows that we'll be here in case anything happened, if he had a question, if he can't fill out a form, uh, he knows that we're right there. And, that, and if uh, his family lived here, then that could be even his family's property, that this would be a tiny home on his family's property. Um, I have to give a shout out to Catherine Boyle. She is, I know she's out there somewhere. She's the founder of Autism Housing Pathways in Massachusetts, and they are doing amazing work um, trying to 
put together zoning bylaws to make it easy for people to be able to, and, and uncumbersome in terms of zoning, for people to add accessory dwelling units, and also a financial mechanism for families to be able to afford um, and get a loan for, for an accessory dwelling unit. So, um, so please check out the Autism Housing Network because her blog post on that is, is right up there on top of the stories. Another thing was that's really neat about tiny homes is you get to custom build it. So you can build in whatever you want. I had mentioned to put together like a little loft um, and it could be like your little sensory hideout, right? Where you have whatever light shows that you prefer, whatever, you know, your widgets are that you prefer um, could be there. Maybe some people will want to create their own little studio that maybe they're crafty or maybe they like to write. Um, they can have their studio with everything organized. Um, one of the things that I would say is that if you're going to design your tiny home, maybe think about age in place. So it might be really cool to sleep in a loft now, but if you got hurt, would there be space for you to put a mattress um, on the bottom floor? So make sure that everyone can, can age in place. All right, Mike, yes, we will get to the toilets <laughs> really soon. Um, so. The other thing that's really neat is being able to add smart home technology, right? So how can we incorporate energy efficiency, smart home technology to make things really easy? And I didn't really think about that. Daniel was the one who was like, the best part of this house is it's easy to maintain. I can just sweep everything out the door and wipe down the counters. Um, he, he doesn't love cleaning. So for him, being able to have just a small space that he can maintain was really helpful for him. Um, and then with that, the whole energy efficiency thing, Mike, you brought that up. Um, how can we make this uh, potentially self-sustainable? So in the tiny house realm, you have tiny homes that are on wheels, and those ones could be like totally off-grid. You have tiny homes that are on wheels or on a foundation, and they hook up similar to an RV, um, so a plug right? And then like a hose to be able to fill up your water tank. And then you can dump if there's a dump station at an RV park, or you can go some Walmarts will have a dump station. So that whole um, water electric system can be set up just like a recreational vehicle, an RV. And then others um, are just like a home, right? Or like an accessory dwelling unit that it would just be like a home. It's just a small home. And that's how it's set up. Um, you had mentioned composting toilets. So I learned more about toilets than I ever thought I would. And there's actually, um, you have composting toilets, which means it's not actually hooked up to water. So for anyone who has ever gone into an RV or camper top, you use the restroom, you flush the toilet, you have to go and release all that black water, right? The black and gray water. You have to dump it after a certain amount of time when the tank gets full. Well, there's other options besides that. You can get a composting toilet, which means um, every time someone uses the restroom, they put some sort of material on top. Sometimes it's like ground up corn husks um, or wood shavings, and then you turn that every once in a while, and um, you know you can add scent and stuff like that. But therefore, there isn't an actual water that has to be drained, so it's a toilet that doesn't use water. Um, another option that I thought was really interesting was this option where it's not a composting toilet. Um, and this toilet was you is the, the man who was there at the Jamboree and described it to me. He said this is used in cottages a lot um, where people are just there on vacation homes. But they um, you use the restroom and the toilet is separated into two tanks. And one tank um, is for urine and you would, you would urinate and and it would go into that tank and it would just drain out into it I guess the typical area it's just pee uh, and then the other uh, matter you don't actually see inside the toilet until you sit on the seat and this section opens up you do your business and there's a fan that is constantly running and so when you stand up it closes that section off and this fan um, dries out the the solid waste in that area and just makes it um, just dehydrates it so similar to if if you walk your dog and you don't pick up your dog's um, waste after a couple days in the Sun it 
it's pretty easy to pick up, it's lightweight, it doesn't really smell like anything, all of that liquid has been dehydrated out of it. So it's similar to that concept. And then basically, after a month or two, you just kind of take it out like the trash, um, or put it in a compost thing, or burn it, uh, whatever whatever you deal with. So thanks for asking the question, Mike. I learned a lot about toilets too at the Tiny Home Jamboree. Um, <laughs> thanks to NASA, all right. Um, and then the other thing that I thought the cool thing about tiny homes was we're seeing so many more autistic entrepreneurs um, really come out and, and getting creative about the products or the services that they offer. And when they have to travel to, say, a, a conference, they have to pay for a hotel room. They're still paying rent where they are. Um, many people still live with their family because it's just not financially feasible. But what if they were able to haul their tiny home to the next conference and then the next conference and the next conference? You can park your tiny home in an RV park. You can just in a regular campsite. You can go to a friend's house. You can give a shout out to all of your friends on Facebook and say, hey, who can I stay with? Um, and it's just, you bring your home to where you have to go. So I thought that was a really neat thing too, that you get to decide um, that you could bring your home wherever you want or live next to the neighbors that you would like to live next to. Um, so something that we do need to talk about is zoning. Um, zoning for tiny homes is really interesting. So in some places, they're really embracing this concept of small living. You know, when we went to the tiny home jamboree, it wasn't just, you know, 200 people. No, this was 40,000 people were at this event. And we would wait, it was like Disneyland. We would wait like a half hour just to walk into a tiny home. Um, and there was 50 of them, it was amazing. It was totally overwhelming, um, but it was awesome. And one of the things that um, had come up was being able to put your tiny home. Where do you put it? How do you deal with zoning laws? And so because this is becoming such a big trend, you know, they have the, the shows on HDTV and stuff. Um, some places are embracing this and they are putting together uh, the bylaws that are necessary to make sure that people can live in tiny homes. Whereas other places are really not doing that. Um, it is, you know, there's a lot of pushback and this is happening um, in more urban areas where we're seeing a lot of pushback. Tiny homes have been promoted as a, as a solution for the homeless, right? And some people don't really like that idea um, in urban areas for health issues, zoning issues. And so um, tiny homes in an urban area may get more pushback than tiny homes in, say, a suburban or a more semi-rural area. Um, if you're thinking about a tiny home and you're thinking about either buying a piece of land, which uh, if you buy a piece of land, you have to put a significant amount of money down in the first place. Um, so that might not be accessible to someone living on their own on the spectrum right now. But um, if your family has property or you're able to lease property from somebody, you may not have as much trouble if you're not making your tiny home on a foundation. So if you have your tiny home on a trailer, a tiny home on wheels, um, you can kind of there may not be as much pushback. Or go to a place that is promoting tiny homes. There's a place out in Texas, in Spur, Texas. That's the tiny home capital of the country. There's a bunch of places in Colorado, um, Woodland Park, I think Durango, um, out in, uh, what's that called? Anyways, so there's there are places that are really embracing this as well. All right, Cheryl, I'm curious about having a community of tiny homes with a type of community center and homes for co-housing or supports for supported living. Are you aware of any communities such as this? I don't know of communities that are specifically only tiny homes, Cheryl. Um, I do know that uh, Down Home Ranch in um, Elgin, Texas, it's just downhomeranch.org, they have recently bought um, micro homes and um, and tiny homes as well. Um, they the, to put on the ranch and right now um, down home ranch. It's basically 30 people, 60 people with and without disabilities. About 30 ranchers with disabilities that live and work on that ranch um, and 30 people without disabilities. And so they started adding those tiny homes because people were becoming more independent uh, and needed 
wanted more private space and wanted to be able to live more independently. So that's really awesome that they have that option. One of the downsides is specifically on that um, in that community at Down Home Ranch, their state is not letting them add HCBS funding. So they're looking at that setting as potentially uh, not HCBS compliant. And for those who follow um, support support services policy, you'll know what I'm talking about. Otherwise, you need to go to the coalition for community choice.com. I mean, dot org and take a look at some of those policy challenges. But down home ranch, all of those settings are not HCBS funded. So these are people who can live only with natural supports or who can private pay um, for their support. All right, Lisa stamps. We want to build a community for high functioning folks on the spectrum. The vision is an acre of land with a pool, clubhouse, a small gathering place inside a horseshoe shaped cluster of homes. Awesome, Lisa. Hey, by the way, if you have an idea um, and you want to be able to build a tiny house community, whether it's one, five, 25, uh, please add a listing on the Autism Housing Network. So we created the Autism Housing Network specifically to be able to provide a platform for people to share their ideas and to share the projects that they want to see happen. You don't have to have a website or a formal business plan or anything. Just go ahead to the Autism Housing Network. At the top menu bar, there's a button that says um, submit a listing. Go ahead and submit a listing. You can also go to the housing directory and there's a little button that says submit a listing on the housing directory as well. Um, while we're talking about the Autism Housing Network, I've also added in our resource directory a, a specific filter for tiny homes and accessory dwellings. So make sure that um, when you go to the resource directory on the Autism Housing Network, you check out those filters on the right hand side. Um, I believe it's the topics filter. You click that, it'll drop down, and then you'll be able to see tiny home accessory dwelling. And so we've had a couple of people submit resources that they liked on tiny homes. Um, if you know of a resource or if you want to share your tiny home builder and you want to be able to share your work, um, please go to the resource directory and submit um, a resource to add there. We have over 250 resources for all different topics, um, whether it's financing housing or finding public assistance or just understanding the different options or understanding policy. We have really a lot of um, a lot of different uh, resources out there. And we also added a tiny home um, section in our forum. So if you go to the forum or the discussions page and you go to creating housing options, um, we created a tiny home topic so that we can continue to have dialogue uh, back and forth. Um, for home furnishing companies specifically innovating for tiny or small houses, considering scale and adaptability, modular, etc., is that the best place for them to go to submit ideas? Yes, please do. Um, or make sure you go to the forum. So you can either have a discussion in forum or you can you can share a business listing um, in the directory. And I think I missed who did I miss up here? Did I miss someone up here? Okay, if I haven't answered your question, please just retype it. Um, sometimes things move fast and I can't necessarily see it. One of the other things that I also wanted to mention was um, making sure that you know that there are there is so much information online about tiny homes. If you use the search function, tiny home or tiny house, those are some of the keywords you can use. Um, there's a bunch of Facebook pages, so go online and just put in tiny home or tiny houses in your Facebook search and you're gonna find a bunch. Pinterest, oh my gosh, there's tons of ideas on Pinterest. Um, you can spend hours just looking at you know, your Pinterest designs. I do want to give another shout out to Stan. So Stan at PT3D, he was at the Tiny Home Jamboree. He had his own booth and he was making um, things using his 3D printer. And he's a designer as well. And so he uh, thought about and figured out some designs that could be helpful for tiny home users. So shout out to Stan. He did um, an awesome job in the interview, and I was really thankful that he was able to do that. And I got to go to his workshop. He also did a workshop at the session, and, and he did a really great job. Um, another thing is there are uh, there's another community. There's a couple of communities, tiny home communities, that I've been um, 
that have contacted me about wanting to find others. So may, I'm not sure if they're going to add themselves to the housing directory. So make sure you email me if you're looking for others to do some sort of community with or at least to connect with them. I'd be happy um, to connect you. Thanks, Catherine Boyle. Yeah, there um, there is a bunch of articles on like tiny homes and how they are helping with housing solutions for the homeless. Unfortunately, I think that the homeless still have a lot of stigma attached to them and that has created a lot of pushback in some places regarding tiny homes. Uh, but I think it's really important that all of us in the disability community and in the aging community say, hey, listen, this is an opportunity for people to be able to own their own home, that they don't have to, they, they'll have stability in their housing, which reflects directly to stability of your life, um, and that we need to be thinking of this as an affordable housing solution in the future. So Mike, you're talking about um, home furnishing designers and things about color or wearability. Um, I would say, Mike, look in the Autism Housing Network. There is, a under topics, there's um, a topic that says design, sensory friendly design. Um, and that would be a really great place for you to get um, some resources. There are several resources that are out there that talk about how to create sensory friendly environments um, and how much environment really does impact quality of life of individuals. So I highly suggest going there um, on the Autism Housing Network resource directory and then looking up some of those design papers. One of the papers is, um, I don't know if you guys saw on the PBS special, it was called First Place Arizona. One of them came from the founder of that community, used was the founder of Sark, and Sark worked with Arizona State University to create the first housing um, report. And I believe that came out in 2009 or 2010, but that's on the Autism Housing Network too. And it incorporates a lot of um, discussion on lighting, on features, on um, colors, on toxicity, a bunch of stuff. So it's a really great report if you're thinking about how can I better design. You know, another thing is I was uh, searching online and I found a Facebook page um, by a young, a young woman who's still in high school and her family, and it's called Autistic Tiny Homes or Autistic Tiny House. Um, they're on Facebook and they want to, this young woman's dream is to be able to help build tiny homes for others with disabilities too. Um, so she's building her, her current house right now um, and then hopes to be able to build homes for others in the future as well. I mean, and talk about tiny home economy. So anyone out there that wants to create a social enterprises that is, you know, tiny homes being built by people with disabilities for people with disabilities, please let me know. I want to be able to help you and put you in touch with some other social entrepreneurs that can maybe give you some tips and tricks to be able to do that. I think that would be a fantastic resource um, and a job opportunities for people with disabilities who like um, construction type work. Okay, we're seeing a lot of interest from local government officials here in Bluffington, South Carolina, Guarding affordable housing for teachers, police, EMTs, etc., who are starting their careers and can't afford to live here. Yeah, it's true. As you noted, Desiree, the big question is how to handle the zoning and where to allow them. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about zoning and some of the areas that I know of. Like I said, you want to go to the Autism Housing Network. Catherine Boyle from Autism Housing Pathways has put forth two pieces of legislation. Um, one of them deals specifically with zoning, and it's a um, it's a model zoning bylaw that essentially, if you own a piece of property with a home um, as a family, and you have a family member who has a disability or or who is aging, who's um, elderly, that as a use by right, so as the property owner, you wouldn't have to jump through all of the hoops that would typically be necessary with approval and zoning and all of that. It would be your right um, because it's your property to be able to develop an accessory dwelling on your property. Now, for the, that piece of legislation, and Catherine, correct me if I'm wrong, it has to be at least 450 square feet. Um, tiny homes are considered tiny homes because they're typically under 400. And I think that that makes it separate from like um, modular housing or prefab housing. Um, and so there's different laws and rules and it's really locally based. So you have to just focus on your own local community. Um, 
and breaking down, I think, misconceptions about what a tiny home is or what it is that you want to do. Um, I think it's Eco Cabins that has spec tiny homes all over. You know, another resource to go to, I believe, is Tiny Home Newsletter. They have listings of tiny homes all across the country. I think they have like over 3,000 listings. So maybe to be able to talk to those people there and say, hey, would you be able to do um, an open house so that our community can see what are the possibilities for tiny homes, that they're not, you know, scary, ugly boxes, but they actually are um, an affordable, housing option. Now another thing to consider is climate, right? Um, I'm originally from South Florida and we have hurricanes and so I would be very aware of can my can my tiny home withstand wing, winds up to 200 you know miles per hour and at the tiny home jamboree I actually went into this one tiny home I think it's also a developer in Texas and they were building fully concrete tiny homes so the whole tiny home was just was concrete um and they had a lot of um a lot of just uh materials on how it can withstand uh the elements so something definitely to think about oh another gosh what was that place um, Oregon, I believe. There is uh, places in or Oregon, Portland, uh, where they really are working with using tiny homes um, or pocket neighborhoods is another term that's being used, um, pocket neighborhoods. It's different than tiny homes, but could incorporate the same features. Um, but there are pocket neighborhoods that are popping up. And this is really a... Um, a movement that isn't a disability movement at all. It's a human movement, you know. There's people who want to have more relational community with their neighbors. They want to know who their neighbors are. They want to interact. They want to be able to, you know, have access to their community um, in a way that's meaningful, not just a, a ghost of a body walking through the sidewalks, but really uh, being able to say hi and recognize people and be able to support each other you know, as the disability population ages, um, and I'm thinking specifically individuals with developmental disabilities who have benefited from the Individual Dis with Disabilities Education Act, I mean, they have a standard of community interaction and integration, and we have to be able to provide um, the structures and the access to, for them to be able to uh, be part and valued in their community. Um, Hopefully this will change right now. As you all know, there's wait lists across the country to be able to access services. It's hard to afford housing, but uh, it's people like you out there that are on calls like this that are going to change the future. Okay, Ambry. Zoning would need to be addressed. There could be the equivalent of a mobile home park for tiny homes. A tiny home park would have sewer water utilities. Support staff in a center could provide a common area for recreation, socialization, and meals. Yeah, you know, um, I think another thing to think about if you're looking at developing some sort of tiny home community, um, does everyone want to live in a tiny home? And should, you know, should it be that that you only have tiny homes. Maybe there should be a couple of larger modular housing where if somebody wants to have two roommates or maybe a host family home situation that they can still be part of the community as well. Um, also, who is the population that you're serving? Making sure that homes are accessible for someone who uses a manual or an electric wheelchair uh, would be really important. And then support staff. I can't tell you how many places I've been to where they've built um, a home for a couple of people with disabilities and those people with disabilities, they never accounted for the actual bodies that they, that would be supporting them. And so a home that seemed like, yeah, it would be more than enough space for three people, um, three people with two of them who use an electric wheelchair and then three support staff, all of a sudden things got really cramped. So really thinking about what are the human support needs that people are going to have and how big should how big does the home need to be in order to accommodate not just the individual who's going to live there but also potentially their support staff is really really important as well questions any more questions or just areas of interest for discussion Okay, well, if there aren't any more questions, um, 
I'm really excited that you all joined us. Uh, I hope that we can continue to do these live feeds. We are going to be sending out a link to a survey. Um, it's really, really important that you fill out this survey because it shows our sponsors that what we're doing is really important and that they need to continue to sponsor us. Um, also, if you know of anyone else who would want to sponsor the Autism Housing Network, uh, as it continues to grow, we need more staff. And so it would be really awesome to be able to find more sponsors um, for the Autism Housing Network so we can continue to outreach and be able to uh, really continue to grow this movement that all of you and all of us are part of. Oh, all right, one more. Um, Heidi Cartan, would a cluster of tiny homes used by people who want SLS services qualify under HCBS? The magic question, Heidi. So for those who um, aren't part of this, um, if you want to learn more in depth, go to coalitionforcommunitychoice.org. There's a lot of really great information. But um, HCBS, Home and Community Based Waivers, are the mechanism by which people pay, there's a public funding to pay for people's support services. So literally the term waiver means to waive the need for institutional care so that people can have access to their supports in their community and in their own home, which is super, super important. Um, there has been some changes in this policy because sometimes that funding was not used just for people who were living in their own home or in the community, that it was being used for um, in settings that were not high quality, um, that may have been institutional. And so now um, these home and community-based waivers have these new regulations and every state has to determine what is home and community-based. And there is a stigma to people with disabilities living together. Um, there's a very bad history in, in our world of disabilities of people being forcefully segregated and um, excluded from their community. And we certainly don't want that to ever happen. Everyone should have a choice of where to live and they should never be forcefully segregated against their will. Um, absolutely not. And a lot of communities, just like the neurotypical population, want to develop these intentional communities, these smaller um, communities within a community to really have that relational engagement um, that a lot of people are seeking in, in our world of technology and disconnection. And so um, Heidi's question gets to, will we be able to use these type of waivers for a tiny home community? And Honestly, Heidi, it's the same issue that people with disabilities would be living um, close to each other. I would say that, you know, making sure that communities are neurodiverse, so it's people with and without disabilities living together. If a setting is consumer controlled, meaning the individual owns their home or rents their home from a landlord and then chooses whatever service provider um, they want, that certainly would help with the process. But the bottom line is the state makes that decision um, whether something is home and community based. Uh, I think it would be really hard for anyone to walk into a cluster of, you know, six tiny homes and say that that's institutional. But, you know, that's just my opinion. And unfortunately, the rules are the rules. And in some states, um, clustering anyone with a disability on like a cul-de-sac, multiple homes on a cul-de-sac um, is really frowned upon in the policy world. And so there are some states where you're going to have to really explain that uh, this is an option that people want and we're not segregating, we're not isolating people, we're just offering a community within the greater community. Um, communication with your state is everything. For those of you who don't know, we at the Autism Housing Network, we um, try to support uh, local communities um, by offering consultations. So if you're doing research and you've looked on all of the information that's on the Autism Housing Network and you've read articles and you get to a point in your journey where you're, you need just a little bit more motivation or a little bit more information to take those next steps or you've run into a barrier that you want help in, please contact us. We provide um, consultations for a donation and would be happy to try to help you in any way, shape or form. All right, any more questions? Information. Oh, thanks, Ellen. Um, okay. Well, then, if nothing else, thank you all so much for joining us. If you haven't already, go to the Autism Housing Network and join. 
Please get engaged, add a listing to the housing directory, add resources to the resource directory, have discussions in the forum. This platform was created specifically to be able to bring together the best ideas in housing. Um, we can create the solutions. We just need to be working and communicating together. Again, thank you to the sponsors of the Autism Housing Network, Case Studio, Marriott Foundation, and American Airlines. This couldn't be done without you. Bye, all.